Welcome to my talk on Beyond CUDA GPU Accelerated Python on cross-vendor graphics cards with Vulkan and Compute. My name is Alejandro Saucedo. <clears throat> I am Engineering Director at Selden Technologies, uh, Chief Scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI and member at large at the ACM. So today we're gonna be delving into a very interesting set of topics, uh, primarily around the parallel and GPU computing ecosystem. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is the Vulkan SDK and how you can use the compute framework um, to build uh, Python uh, GPU accelerated applications uh, together with a set of hands-on examples as well as some references um, that you can actually delve into if you're more interested. So to start with, we want to cover uh, the motivations of why parallel processing. And uh, I'm going to be referencing a research survey um, that uh, I recommend checking out um, as well in itself, as it basically collects insights from uh, 227 uh, papers in the uh, parallel deep learning space, which provides a much more uh, 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 intuitive perspective of, of, of the adoption uh, and this trend of adoption on GPU for not just scientific computing, but also general purpose computing. And uh, some key observations that are really interesting is to see how um, um, the emphasis around uh, a lot of the, the functions and paradigms in these uh, 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 computational um, uh, areas that can be abstracted into high, highly parallelizable steps and others that may not uh, in themselves be highly parallelizable can actually be reduced into equivalent uh, uh, um, uh, structures that, that then can be processed uh, with uh, specialized hardware uh, like GPUs or even, you know, more specialized hardware like TPUs. Uh, there's also concepts that are uh, continuously evolving. Um, uh, you know, a simple one that uh, may, you may have come across is the concept of micro-batching, which is basically being able to not just process a single data point, uh, but also being able to process uh, several more at the same time to ensure that uh, the computation is done uh, at a single um, or, you know, uh, in a way intuitively on a single sort of uh, parallel clock speed uh, or clock iteration within uh, that, that, that perspective instead of just submitting each one separately. As well as different uh, very interesting and innovative ways of breaking down computation that can actually be processed in parallel to then be uh, uh, re-aggregated. And the interesting thing about this paper is not only how the trend is moving towards this parallel processing and uh, you know GPUs uh, and, and specialized GPU uh, type uh, hardware, uh, but also uh, that it's uh, expanding into uh, distributed processing, leveraging uh, this uh, uh, parallel capable type of hardware. Uh, so a really interesting area. Um, now delving into the, into the ecosystem um, and the motivations of why, uh, you know, we're even having uh, uh, a new sort of framework, the Vulkan SDK, which we're going to introduce in a bit, uh, is particularly given that there is this sheer uh, range and, 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 and uh, heterogeneity when it comes to the GPU and parallel capable uh, processing hardware uh, um, like TPUs, etc., cetera, um, that involves multiple different players, multiple different architectures, different drivers, and um, consequently different uh, uh, frameworks available to uh, take advantages of uh, these um, uh, parallel capabilities, as well as, for example, um, you know, the increase in uh, very powerful uh, mobile uh, capable uh, uh, components that now we're carrying in, in our pockets uh, as, as, as smartphones. So there is a, a sheer amount of uh, uh, need in this space due to the heterogeneity uh, of the different uh, hardware across different vendors. Um, and from that same perspective is one of the key motivations uh, of why uh, Vulkan uh, came to be. Uh, Vulcan is a, uh, a cross-industry initiative uh, that brings in uh, several of the leading industry players to create this open source, and I think that's the, the uh, one of the more exciting parts, the open source and open uh, 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 sort of uh, standard that uh, uh, focuses on not just uh, 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 interoperability, but also performance. And this is reflected in the interface that is exposed uh, by uh, the uh, Vulkan uh, uh, SDK. 
Now, in regards to the, the, the Vulcan C++ SDK, there are several you know, advantages and disadvantages as you would have with anything. Some of the very strong advantages is that it has uh, a very low level uh, interface with rich access to components. That comes with this explicit and verbose uh, C style API within its core that uh, provides you a, um, you know, no uh, language um, 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 sort of sophisticated uh, verbosity or abstractions uh, pure direct access into not just the Vulkan SDK, but also the hardware uh, underneath, right? And this is very important for uh, optimizations that are necessary. There are a broad range of industry leading players that are contributing to the standards and to, to, the, to the SDKs and to the tooling, which has been uh, very, very uh, encouraging to see. Um, and also there is an emphasis towards this interoperability and high compatibility across different platforms, mobile, suppliers, AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, etc. And, you know, this is very, very strong strengths, right? Strong advantages. You know, disadvantages, you know, we also have that it's very low level with rich access to components, which means that there is uh, a lot of complexity and, you know, a very rich interface that needs to be interacted with. And then similarly with the C style API, even though it provides you a what, what you see is what you get with the hardware level, that means that there needs to be a lot of uh, domain specific knowledge to be able to uh, build the foundational layers required to start building the application components, right? With that, uh, there's also the broad range of top players, which even though it's a great thing, always uh, with many opinions, many voices, uh, there will be uh, a, a, a lot of sort of interactions uh, that will be pulling toward different directions, even though they would have the sort of like best uh, uh, in, in, in mind and, and trying to push for, uh, uh, you know, what is, what is best. And uh, again, you know, with a high compatibility across multiple different platforms, that means that it needs to deal with a very rich interface that, uh, and not just rich interface, but, but rich set of um, 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 uh, flexible, you know, backends that can actually inter interact with, with this sheer number of, of different uh, uh, um, hardware uh, that is underneath. And now let's see what the architecture of the Vulkan SDK looks like. So the Vulkan application is the overarching component that we will be uh, uh, seeing. Uh, from applications, you can actually spin up instances. These instances are the ones that then allow you to, uh, you know, talk with your physical hardware. So physical device is the C++ component that, you know, actually re refers to the, to, the, to the physical graphics card that you have in your computer. And then you can create what is referred to as logical devices or windows or views that then allow you to interact with, physic with that physical device, right? So that logical device, you know, you can have multiple logical devices for one single physical device. And we can have multiple physical devices for an instance and multiple instances for an application, right? So this is where it starts getting a bit complex. But you know, to keep it simple, you know, with this logical device, the way that you interact with the, with the, with the, with the uh, graphics card is through a queue. And this queue would have multiple commands, right? You submit the instructions that need to be executed, right? And ultimately, this is how you would be able to uh, submit instructions to the GPU. Once you actually want to run more complex components, that's where the pipeline comes in. You know, there's the compute pipeline, the graphics pipeline, but we're gonna be just talking about the compute pipeline. This is all just to provide an intuition. You know, we actually have another talk that you'll be able to reference and check out as well as the documentation that explains all of this in detail. This is just to give you an intuition once we delve into, uh, into the deeper depths of everything. Um, with the pipeline, this is what you're able to say, well, I want to actually run a specific set of instructions as per a piece of code or an algorithm that is often referred to as a shader, uh, a shader module. Uh, this shader is basically going to look like a piece of C code that just so happens to run on the GPU itself. And this shader, this piece of shader in the pipeline will also interact with data, right? And this data is referenced through the concept of descriptor sets, which again, you know, you're not gonna really have to like know all of these different things, but uh, it's still important uh, to get an intuition uh, that this is what's happening under the hood, right? So the script sets are just like a, con a, a container that basically says, well, I'm going to be using this GPU visible, um, GPU visible data so that when you run a set of instructions, it can actually reference this, these different things. And you see that because we're interacting with this queue, the CPU in itself is able to send uh, requests, sorry, send, send instructions to the GPU 
uh, with its own specific memory address space. And even though there are shared address spaces, which means that you know the CPU may have access to see some of the data in, in, in the GPU memory, there is different address spaces for different uh, computational um, 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 areas in the, in the actual hardware of the GPU, which means that the actual code, your C++, your Python, will not be able to see that memory space. Right, and that means that you would be able to interact with your GPU with this SDK akin to what would be you interacting with a remote service, sending requests for the service to execute as if it was an API. And you know, even though this is not correct because this is your, your own machine, this is actually a, a good intuitive way to see how you're interacting with that GPU, given that it is through this queue with uh, you know asynchronous command uh, buffers that are executed. And of course, you can then have all the things that allow you to await until the execution has been finished, which we may actually talk about um, in later on. And, you know, being able to build the foundation code required to actually run a simple program in Vulkan, you know, only takes, you know, from 500 to 2000 lines of C++ code, right? And this is the motivations, well, some of the motivations for Compute itself, the Compute framework. So Compute enables uh, uh, developers to get started interacting with the Vulkan SDK with dozens instead of thousands of lines of code. And the key thing to emphasize here is that the core principle is to augment the Vulkan interface instead of abstracting or hiding it. Uh, it has a bring your, all, uh, you bring your own Vulkan interface, which plays nicely with already existing Vulkan applications. So if you already have a Vulkan application to render uh, graphics related stuff, you'd be able to actually pass those Vulkan components. And it has non-Vulkan naming convention. And we're gonna talk about that. It's just basically to avoid ambiguity as there are libraries that you know, may have uh, classes called buffer. And it's like, is this buffer from Vulkan or for this other application, right? So things like that. Um, so now in regards to other features is that it has you know, a C++ interface, but also the Python interface that we're gonna be using today. It has explicit CPU and GPU memory ownership. And this is important if you're using uh, non-compute uh, uh, Vulkan uh, components, right? If you're already using Vulkan in another area of code, raw Vulkan. Uh, it gives you granular access to GPU queues, which is very important for optimizations, uh, you know, which we have some material that actually exp uh, ex explores that in more detail. Um, there is, you know, single header file for the C++ development and a uh, PyPy module for easy installation with the Python. And it has integration with uh, mobile apps, uh, through the Android NDK, as well as game engines uh, such as Godot, which is also part of the uh, FOSDEM conference. Um, and there is going to be a, a few links about that. So how does the, 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 the compute architecture look like? Um, and this is basically uh, relatively or conceptually simple. So everything starts with a compute manager. And the compute manager is the component that basically oversees and, and manages all the uh, explicitly relevant uh, memory uh, that uh, is then created through your uh, interaction with this uh, like compute uh, application. So the manager in itself would handle this sort of like device and, and, and the queue, which we, we talked about. You know, you don't need to go know into that much depth, but it's still important. You would then have sequences, and sequences are basically uh, basically single or batches of operations to run on the GPU. Right, that's basically what a sequence is. And you can have multiple sequences with multiple operations. Each sequence can have one or many operations and each operation basically performs a specific uh, action. An operation can have one or multiple tensors and tensors are basically uh, abstractions into uh, GPU and CPU memory, uh, as well as the workflows related to move uh, the memory around it. And optionally, it can also have what in the compute world is referred to as an algorithm. And an algorithm abstracts the concept of the pipeline, the Vulkan pipeline, the, uh, the scriptor sets, uh, and the specific shader code that then you can actually say, well, I want to run this, this code in the GPU with this specific uh, data um, uh, structures, and uh, I want to run it in this uh, type of way, right? So we will see what that actually looks like in more practical terms, but this is basically it, right? There's 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 not much more around this. And there is an almost one-to-one -one mapping between uh, the compute components and the Vulkan components. And that is explicitly to uh, reduce ambiguity. Now let's see what that looks like. So in Python, you would basically create a uh, simple uh, uh, manager, right? 
you would then create a set of tensors with, you know, you can pass NumPy arrays or, or Python lists. Uh, in this case, it's basically just uh, two uh, tensors that are going to be used in a multiplication and then the output where we're going to save uh, all of the results, right? So that's what we're going to basically use. Uh, you normally would actually initialize the tensors explicitly, but there's a set of helper functions that, you know, take your CPU host memory list and then copy it into GPU only memory. So all of this is, is, is handled to you, but again, it's not handled through magic. Every single thing can be actually accessed and you can actually call those things yourself if you wish to, which is very important for, for, for several optimizations. You then define the shader code. This is basically the, the code that you're gonna be running in the GPU. In this case, it's just basically a simple multiplication using the pi shader uh, um, uh, decorator. In this case, we have the first buffer, the second buffer. We're gonna run a multiplication and store it in the output. That's basically it. This is gonna run in the GPU. And then we're gonna actually run it through the manager. So we're gonna say, we want to run this synchronously uh, using these three tensors and using this uh, 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 shader, right? And we can just basically pass that. It runs synchronously. We can also run it asynchronously and we can actually uh, do a lot of optimizations, which we're not gonna delve into this, but you can run it synchronously. Once it's finished running, then you can actually copy the data back, right? Make sure that the, the output is now visible in the CPU and then you can print it, right? So you can actually see that our output is two, four, six, right? So that's basically it. That's all there is to it. And this is all you need to basically do all of the uh, crazy, crazy stuff uh, that happens underneath. But again, all of that crazy, crazy stuff is really, really interesting. And it is also very, very useful, very rich and very relevant for once you're starting to do optimizations. So ultimately not to hide, but to augment. This is the key thing. So now let's actually delve into some of those optimizations that I've been mentioning. What we did right now is run a single command slash operation in through the manager, right? So we, we, we had the CPU running, we submitted that operation, we waited, then we came back, we then submitted the second one, and then we came back, right? But what we can do as well is we can actually reuse multiple sequences, um, which means that we can pre-record commands. So we can record a bunch of operations and then run them. So the CPU would basically then execute. There would be specific, you know, operations that would run already, uh, you know, at this, uh, in the GPU, and then it you would actually wait until it's come back. You can actually run a synchronous um, 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 dispatches or submissions of the, of, the, of, the, of the commands, which means that you can actually uh, not wait for the GPU to finish. So you can actually submit this. You know, the CPU would continue doing other things while the GPU is doing other things. And then you can submit something else asynchronously and then do something else. There's also an await function that allows you to wait for the thing to, to finish. And then finally, something that we're not covering in this presentation, but it is also very interesting, is that you can also leverage GPU hardware concurrent queues to submit multiple uh, uh, batch operations that would then execute in different GPU queues that then would potentially run in parallel. And this is dependent on the uh, hardware properties of your GPU and the families. You know, normally, for example, in my NVIDIA 1650, uh, I have uh, the ability to run Con hardware concurrent uh, uh, batches of, of, of uh, GPU loads, uh, if I submit them to uh, one compute family queue and one graphics family queue. We're not gonna delve into that, but if you're interested, you know, there's, there's a lot of like really um, uh, relevant uh, content in the, in the documentation as well as in, in our other talk. But today we're gonna be actually covering something um, that delves into the world of machine learning. And what better thing to cover than the hello world of machine learning, logistic regression. Basically taking in a specific data point and classifying it as either you know, correct or false. In this case, it's just a binary classification. And we're gonna be letting the machine do the learning in the GPU. Well, what are we gonna be doing? In terms of intuition, we're gonna have uh, input data that is gonna look like two numbers uh, that are gonna go through our model, our machine learning model, and are gonna perform a prediction which ultimately should be um, what we are expecting. What our data looks like, uh, at least the training data that we're gonna be using, the training data that we're gonna be using is gonna be basically, um, you know, when we see zero and zero, we expect zero. When we see zero and one, we expect one. When we see one and one, we expect one. And we have like, you know, a, a bunch of different training data that looks like this, extremely simple, I know, but just to make sure that, you know, the intuition comes through as opposed to the machine learning. I mean, this is not a machine learning talk. Um, 
And then, you know, what we're doing is we want to actually train a machine learning model, basically learn the parameters that would allow us to ensure that every time that we have these inputs, we provide the respective outputs, right? And, you know, we, uh, uh, there is sort of like a more in-depth blog post that covers the uh, underlying, um, uh, you know, functions and um, uh, the way that everything is broken down, but we're going to skim through some of that. Uh, if you're curious, you can actually delve into that. We're still going to talk about what's actually going to be happening. We're going to be trying to find the parameters of this function. This is going to be the input, basically that uh, sort of like uh, specific x1 and x2 that you saw. Um, in this case, because we want to actually leverage the hardware parallel uh, capabilities, we're going to be able to submit multiple as micro batches. So instead of just running one by one, we're going to be running like five at the same time. So the GPU actually runs five and then comes back to us. Um, so that's, that's how we're going to be uh, able to do this. We're going to be learning these two parameters, W and B. And we're going to be basically, you know, this is the function that calculates that prediction. Right. We're not going to be delving into too many, too much of the depths, but there's a blog post that covers this in a bit more detail. There's thousands of talks that talk about logistic regression in Python. So more than welcome to, to uh, check that. Key thing here is that this will be the, the shader code that we're going to be writing, right? And even though we're not going to cover in much detail, we're still going to be looking at what that what actually uh, 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 required to, to actually write that. And in the compute side, so this is the shader, but the compute side is what is going to be running this. We're going to have to create a bunch of tensors that represent our input data, our, 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 our parameters, uh, our, our, our predictions, et cetera, et cetera, the training data. We're going to have to initialize those tensors using, um, you know, on, on the sequence. We're going to initialize uh, uh, the algorithm, right? And then we're going to actually, so we're going to record it. So this is just to actually like initialize them. And then we're going to iterate and learn, let the machine do the learning, right? So we're actually going to be running uh, uh, multiple different sort of like iterations to that data set, uh, updating the parameters every single time, running micro batches that are running in the GPU in parallel. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing this, but um, yeah, so we're going to be basically doing that. And um, then once we actually uh, uh, iterate those 100 times, we're going to be having learned those parameters. Right, so that's basically what we're going to be doing in this uh, high-level logic, and you know, you know, this is just an intuition, right? The key thing here is to see what's happening in the in the compute and in the in, in the in the shader side. So the, the the shader, what it it looks like, is just a much more complex version of what we saw earlier, right? So we have all of the inputs, so x i, which is x one, x two, uh, is each of them. They're going to be an array because it's micro batches. We have the expected outputs. We have the weights uh, that are coming in and we have the, the weights that are output and calculated. Remember that uh, the parameters that we're learning are W and B. So those are things that we actually want to take out. And, you know, we're also taking the loss uh, to be able to reuse where, where relevant and the number of, of, of parameters to use, right? So in this case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be, uh, you know, taking the specific uh, input uh, weights that are continuously being updated. These are the ones, the parameters that are, we're going to update in each execution. So we have to pass them every single time. We're going to be calculating the function, right? So as we saw, uh, you know, this is basically the, the, the function that, that we just had. And, you know, in the blog post, I break it down in very minute detail of how um, we actually um, uh, go through each of, of these steps and, and, and calculate the derivatives, the partial derivatives of each of them, as well as the, as the respective loss. But here, the key thing is that we uh, are able to ultimately calculate the, 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 the parameters um, uh, that, that we now have, right? So now in the compute side, we're going to first create all of the specific tensors. So as we saw, we had some training data. This is the 0, 0 equals 0, uh, 1, 0 sh should be that, uh, you know, one, one should be one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, this is how we start with our weights. So we start with just like a random initialization, which then, you know, we're going to be iterating towards. We're going to then similarly start with, uh, you know, random initialization for our other parameter, which is going to be zero. And uh, then the number of, uh, you know, uh, data points is going to be uh, basically um, uh, the actual no size of this parameter, right? So we're going to start with, with five. Right, so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be storing that in a variable called parameters so that we can reference them. We're then going to just initialize it by creating our manager and initialize the tensors. So what this does is it actually initializes them explicitly, whereas before we didn't do it, we did it, we did it implicitly with a, with a utility function. So here we're saying initialize all of the parameters in the GPU so they're accessible in GPU memory. 
Then we're actually creating and recording this, the, 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 the operations in the sequence. So what are the operations? We're gonna first actually uh, sync the data to device for these two tensors, because remember the parameters are gonna be updated every iteration. So we're gonna put them in the uh, GPU device uh, uh, memory. We're gonna then uh, record that algorithm that we just actually uh, wrote. This is the, the logistic regression shader uh, that you saw. So we're gonna record that execution. And then we're gonna record a sync to local, right? So we're gonna record for all of the weights, uh, the parameters and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the loss to actually be copied back to the host so that Python can see them, right? And then finally, we're gonna iterate a hundred times by you know, every iteration running that shader or running the sequence, which is basically all of the things that we just recorded and then operating uh, and then updating all of the, uh, all of the weights. So I, I think there's an indentation missing here, but basically what is happening here is we're just basically updating it by you know, the specific uh, learning rate, which is just how fast do we want uh, the actual parameters to be updated on each iteration. Again, the key thing here is just to see all of the features that you're able to use with compute and leveraging a simple machine learning use case as an example that of course we're skimming through, I'm conscious, sorry for that, for the people that, you know, maybe are seeing this and going like, well, you know, actually that's, you know, not hundred percent correct, but you know, in the blog post, I break it down in, you know, much more minute detail. This is just to show how you're able to actually interact with the GPU and, you know, uh, optimize in different areas by, you know, pre-recording components, using the sequence, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, we're just iterating. Once you finish, you're able to then just print uh, the calculated parameters, which in this case, they are uh, the first weight, the second weight, um, the, the, the third weight, uh, and uh, the actual um, uh, B uh, uh, bias, which is ultimately what um, we uh, ended up with. Actually, no, so this is basically the weights for the first uh, uh, component, and then, uh, yeah, ultimately calculating what is uh, the output. Uh, and, you know, just to emphasize, you know, we covered kind of like this high level example, but as I, as I mentioned, we have a blog post that covers this one in Python, one in C++, it breaks it down in, in, in minute detail. And we have other tutorials, other examples that cover, you know, how to use this and actually the C++ uh, 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 as opposed to the Python one for uh, integrating with your Android apps, as well as to game engines like the Godot engine, uh, which we would recommend to check out. And, you know, more than anything, what I recommend is to get involved. Um, you know, if you go to uh, github.com slash ethical ML slash Vulcan compute, uh, you'd be able to actually check out what are some of the open issues. Uh, you know, you can take one of the good first issues, uh, labeled good first issues. And also please, you know, there's open, there's uh, an issue number uh, 52, which is open for just general discussion. So if you have ideas for improvement or questions, you can actually just post them there. And we've had some really interesting suggestions. Some of the key things in the roadmap, uh, you know, one of the main motivations to build this framework is to actually integrate it as a backend of an existing scientific computing framework uh, that is uh, potentially even being used for, uh, you know, mobile, um, you know, machine learning or for other uh, types of use cases. So definitely really interesting on that. And if someone is, uh, you know, running a scientific computing library, then, you know, being open to explore. Uh, also creating more default operations, something like a fast Fourier transform or like a parallel sum uh, reduction, uh, things like that would be really cool to have like out of the box operations that are, you know, perhaps even written in C++, but also exposed uh, as Python. And then also adding examples. If you try this uh, in a new sort of shader uh, or a new sort of like a, a algorithm, uh, a new machine learning uh, type of model, uh, you know, would love to actually contribute to upstream and, you know, add it to the repo because I think that that would be very cool. Um, so with that said, uh, I think that's everything uh, that we had sort of to cover today. Uh, thank you very much for joining this talk on Beyond CUDA GPU Accelerated Python on cross-vendor graphics card with Vulkan and Compute. Uh, really looking forward uh, to explore and hear your thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. And uh, if you have any questions, do please feel, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.